Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Kia ora everyone, this is Mickey, and you are listening to Wikipedia. and this week on the podcast I speak to physiologist Professor Karen Esser all about circadian biology and the importance of it for our overall health. Professor Esser talks to me about what we know with regards to the inputs or what impacts our circadian rhythm and what even is a circadian rhythm and how important regulating both our master clock, which sits sort of in our brain behind our eyes, and the peripheral clocks for our overall health outcomes. And every cell in our body or every organ and our muscle tissue, all of our physiology has these peripheral clocks. So they play quite a big role in regulating our hormones, enzymes, appetites, everything. We discuss how exercise impacts our circadian biology because as a physiologist, that's where Professor Essa has spent a lot of her time researching. And we also talk about the impact of the circadian rhythm on metabolizing different nutrients and what we do and don't know about the impact of our circadian rhythm on the absorption of pharmaceuticals and supplements. This is such a great conversation, and I think you're really going to love it. She's a wealth of information. So Dr. Essa is a professor of physiology and associate director of the Myology Institute at the University of Florida. So her lab has been working in the area of skeletal muscle adaptation for over 20 years. And while initially her research was focused on understanding the molecular mechanisms that underlie adult skeletal muscle adaptation to exercise, In 2002, they discovered genes that were important for circadian rhythms and that they were also at work in skeletal muscle. So since that early observation, her lab has pioneered research on the role of circadian rhythms and the circadian clock mechanism in skeletal muscle. So I'll put links to where you can find Dr. Esser and her research in the show notes. And just before we kick off into the podcast, I'd like to remind you the best way for you to support Wikipedia is to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and give us a five-star rating. That would be amazing because that just then increases the visibility of Wikipedia to other people out there looking for some science-based health and nutrition podcasts to further inform their understanding of health, which is basically what you're doing by listening to this and what I'm doing by bringing these conversations to you. And of course, if you wanted to, you could also jump online to my website, mickeywillardin.com, where for my birthday weekend, which is this coming weekend, I'm doing a 50% off sale on all of my programs. So my real food nutrition program, my fat loss program for women, flow, the man plan, my keto longevity, my athlete program, all 50% off to celebrate the fact that I am 45. And no, I can't believe it. That's over at mickeywillardin.com. But for now, please enjoy the conversation that I have with Professor Karen Esser. Professor Karen Esser, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me this morning about circadian rhythm. Um, I'm a you know um, a geek when it comes to things related to exercise, health, and how just sort of other inputs impact on all of that uh, area, I suppose, and our physiology. Can I get us to kick off with you just giving us a really good 101 on circadian rhythm? Because I feel like it's a it's it's more complex than what people think, and just having a good understanding of that um, before we sort of get into your research and and things like that. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot um, because you're right; it, it it can be more complicated. But I, I hopefully we can come across clearly on this. So I, th- I think most everybody has a general sense of what circadian rhythms are, meaning that, that they, they, so, we, so we define them as 24-hour oscillations 
and historically it's been behavior. So sort of sleep rest, you know, your, your, your daily, what time do you get up in the morning? What time do you go to bed? What time, you know, those kinds of things that these are repeating behaviors that we have, but, but what makes them, um, actually just, uh, defined as circadian is that these behaviors will happen without any change in our environment. Now this, mm. this is, um, most easily seen when we look at things like plants. Uh, so if you've ever noticed plants that their leaves will sort of open in the daytime or the light, and then they will sort of close down in the dark. The very first known circadian experiment was a monk that took some of these plants and just stuck them into a constant light condition environment. And mm. the leaves still opened at the time you'd expect them and then closed at the time you would expect. So this change in leaf positioning had nothing to do with light and dark, but actually was coming from information within the plant. And so hmm. that, we, we, th that concept is, is really how we define circadian rhythms. It's that we most associate circadian rhythms with light and dark, um, but the reality is these behaviors um, happen independent of light and dark. So there was a study done with humans where they went and lived in a cave where the temperature was constant. They didn't have access to light. And, you know, they just tracked their physiology and their behaviors. And it's, you know, for humans, it was slightly over 24 hours. We can see this yeah. in rodents. We can see this in, like I said, plants. We can see this in insects and bacteria. I mean, it's it's the concept of circadian rhythm spans the, spans planet Earth and life forms. So, yeah. so it's just really a fundamental thing. Now, the 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 biggest move in terms of um, uh, in in terms of directing my own research career and 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 its and the role of circadian rhythms then in human health came when there was a discovery of how these rhythms are regulated. That there is a gene yeah. mechanism, a genetic mechanism, that exists in all of our cells that acts like a timer. And that timer yeah. runs for 24 hours. And so that discovery was in the 80s um, and actually ended up winning the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. But but so so that that, you know, these, these circadian patterns are again, they're they're uh, they're um, um, driven at the level of every single cell in your body and 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 can be expressed based on your whole behavior um, and can be linked to a set of genes that yeah. basically function like a, a, a timekeeping mechanism. Yeah. So, um, Karen, so we have the the master clock, but there are also peripheral clocks as mm -hmm. well. How do they sort of interact? So, so, the, 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 so the, the terminology master clock is changing. So for various reasons, <sighs> the word master is pro probably not one of the ones that we, we like to embrace these days. But the other, the other point being, so, that, so classically, the, the, the hypothalamus, there was a region in the hypothalamus in the brain that was considered the the master and and that so that this was a, a clock mechanism in your brain and it, it and and the and the model was that it told all the other clocks in the rest of your body sort of what to do the reality yeah. is this this model no longer holds true and so so it's so what we talk about now is that clock in the brain is more like the conductor of an orchestra yeah. And so all the clocks in your body are members of the orchestra. And if they want to go off and do something, <laughs> they can um, and they yeah. will and they do. Um, the goal of that central clock is really to try to hold everybody together because we are all healthier and function better if our clocks are all basically on the same time zone or in the same same aligned in the same way. And so the so the yes, so the way I look at it personally, from my own research perspective, is that this central clock in the brain is really critically important for timing of things like sleep-wake, feeding behaviors. And then the information that comes from these things, like what time we're act active, what time we're eating, and this kind of thing, that information then helps to set the, the phases of the clocks in the periphery. So, so the central clock is very important, um, mm -hmm. but it is not a dominant, and 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 there's, it's not a a dominant controlling clock, and and there is also some growing out of evidence that some of the things from the periphery can actually talk back to the brain, and so I think oh. it's a really, ex I mean, it's it's a wonderful, co challenging concept, uh, but we're still uh, still a lot to be learned. Yeah. So, um, Professor Karen, is it 
so all of our genes, our hormones, our temperature, like everything is governed by these clocks, the mm-hmm. conductor and then the sort of the the peripheral clocks. Is that mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So so it's I mean I think the way I, the way I think about it is yeah so it's things like core temperature things like heart rate yeah. blood pressure so your autonomic things that are related from a physiological sense your autonomic nervous system but then even at the level of cells so so you know the substrate metabolism these all these things all exhibit time of day variances that are that are downstream of this clock mechanism and this can occur either at the level of the cell or sort of again as 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 the autonomic nervous system, let's say, talks to other tissues. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it is complicated. I don't want, what I want to get across is that some of these oscillations are absolutely downstream of the clock. It's not everything. So, so yeah. you know, obviously if you get stressed independent of what time it is or something else happens, these things can override whatever the clock is doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so what, what disrupts clock physiology then? What do we know might impact negatively on the conductor or the peripheral clocks? So the um, what we know the most about is is obviously the conductor, the SCN, and so mm. um, obvi- you know things like travel. So going mm-hmm. to different time zones where the you know so all of a sudden instead you know you're 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 used to so whatever you're you're at eight or nine o'clock in the morning in New Zealand. Eight o'clock, yeah, yeah. Right, and so I'm at four o'clock in the afternoon. So so if we swap places, you know, our, all of a sudden our SCNs would be receiving light at a very different time of day. And so yeah. that, I mean, so so the good part is the clock senses that and, and it and adjusts. The, ba- the challenge is it is not an immediate adjustment. So there is a time mm. period where things are a little bit um, off. And yeah. and this is going to be true across the body, so not just the brain, but all your other clocks. So this is what jet lag is. Jet lag is basically a circadian syndrome, where the clocks in your body are out of alignment. You know, it's it's not lethal. It's uncomfortable, and and we also know different people adjust differently. We do know things like use of physical activity and attention to timing of eating can help speed up or or help make that transition go faster. Um, so that's one example where, where you just, so the clocks are, are always running, but mm. the, the, the clocks are sensitive to information from the environment. And so the brain clock is sensitive to what time light comes in. So those night mm-hmm. readers that people have, you know, that's another thing people have to think about because that light coming from those readers is, is informing the clock in your brain at some level. Um, now, peripheral clocks, they're more sensitive to things like what time you eat and what time you exercise. And so there's a term called social jet lag. And, and so that's basically you can sit at home, but you can mm-hmm. create a physiological jet lag just by getting normal exposure to light, but maybe eating at midnight or exercising at two in the morning. or so, so you've got competing time information, one piece of information being light, telling your central clock, here, this is where we are. And then you have these other time cues like feeding and exercise being offset from their normal times. And so that mm-hmm. that creates a misalignment. So the peripheral clocks will follow feeding and exercise. The central clock yeah. will stay with lighting. And, and you can create jet lag misalignment without travel. So yeah. <laughs> they're therefore social jet lag. Yeah. And um, what is your opinion on daylight savings? Oh, we need to get rid of it. It's, <laughs> it's yes, I, and that's what I hear a lot of people who sort of are in your field and research. Yeah. You know um, the the sort of impact. So even if so, it's it's only a, a quote unquote only an hour, but does it have the sort of negative health impact, which which therefore would like just influences us in a bad way over time is that what the yeah i mean it's so so, yeah i mean the the, this is actually the 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 research organization that is sort of the home for circadian scientists in the united states is called the society for research and biological rhythms 
And we now have, you know, uh, statements about this and, and are working, trying to work with legislature to make sure everybody understands this. I mean, there, A, there's no reason to change clocks. You know, this the reason we had that is no longer exists. So we don't need to change. So then the question becomes, do we stick with standard time or do we go to daylight savings? And the data on that are pretty clear that, that standard time is actually the proper and most healthy time way to track time. Mm. Um, and and it's, so there's there's quite a bit of epidemiological evidence. And, 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 and again, so there, that the consensus is pretty strong that no, no need to change clocks and standard time is, is by far the, the most healthy for the way we live and our physiologies. Okay. And so what is the negative impact then of daylight saving? So if, if standard time is most healthy, what are we pl putting ourselves at risk of when we have this sort of change? Yeah. So these, so, so I mean, I, I, I should know the actual answer to that, but I, you know, so the, the, I'm, what I'm going to say is, um, so A, if people are really interested, the, the details of that are on the SRBR website. But the the, the concept here is that, you know, our, our standard time is set with the idea that, you know, sort of high noon is w when the sun is at its peak. And yeah. so then and then, you know, and so that's what standard time is set on. And that seems to be, you know, classically where our 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 health is best when you offset that by an hour. Again, it's, not, you know, one day, obviously one year, we obviously live with it. Yeah. But but it it's going to increase probabilities of things like metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease. So this this is not like you can't sit here and say that one hour it causes yeah, yeah, diabetes. Yeah. Mm. No, I'm not going to saying that. But will it increase the, because of some of the problems with the circadian misalignment that occurs by sort of offsetting things by an hour? Then, then you you do increase probabilities of a variety of chronic diseases. Yeah, and so um, and then then there are also issues with with people who have children in school. And yeah. so it's one thing when it's sort of sort of spring summer months, but but if we stuck to daylight savings time. Then, you know, when we get into the winter months here, there are some parts of the United States that those that, you know, that it's going to be pitch black when buses are going to pick up kids for school. Well, and, you know, it won't be light until 10 a.m. or something like that. Mm. And and so thinking about the health and activity levels of children, it, it is it, it that has a negative influence on that as well. So there's some safety issues as as well as just some fundamental biology health issues. Yeah. And what is the legislate what are the legislators uh opinions on the um <laughs> On your recommendations, because it's interesting, right? Because in nutrition, I know, you know, we do a lot of research on what's um, potentially much better in terms of overall health for people, what they should be eating. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the policymakers are going to go, well, this is oh, what gotcha. we should be doing. So um, do you feel like there's going to be any shift in this anytime soon or any when they're going to take it seriously, your recommendations? Well, you know, so it's, it's sort of... Um... So there are people in Congress here in the United States that are very sensitive to this and and have been working with the organization to and and, and in fact there were there were a couple of there was a bill that was brought up to make daylight saving time perfect permanent mm -hmm. and that was rejected. So mm -hmm. so there's an so so the message so we're really happy the message has gotten out to enough people to just to to actually go no this isn't the right way yeah now there obviously there, there are lobbying groups like um so i live in florida let's say theme parks like let's say disney world they would love to have more light hours to you know keep people spending money in their theme parks and golf courses and i'm not sure all who are in that but that's those are the groups that people talk about the most yeah and and they have influence and so depending on that influence um but again, I think when people think about daylight savings time, they only think about it during the summer months because historically that's how it's used. Yeah. But as we transition away from changing our clocks, we have to think about this as a year long uh, lifestyle. Yeah. And, 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 and the other part, too, is there are parts of the United States that actually did go to daylight savings time permanently mm. and they hated it. And they change back. So um, and the and, you know, so the U.S. is obviously this sort of. Um, 
messy place uh, where, so there are maybe 11 states that now that do not change time for, Mm -hmm. you know, daylight savings time or or that. And all of those 11 are all on standard time. And so I I think I, I, I'm cautiously hopeful that the momentum has us going in the right direction on this. Yeah. Interesting. Karen, can you describe what it is about that even what seems like a slight shift in time or misalignment of the clocks, why does that negatively impact our metabolic health? All right, let's start. So what what my lab has done is studied uh, circadian clocks in muscle. So what we have learned is that what the circadian clock is regulating, so part of what we know the clock in muscle is doing is it it is regulating substrate metabolism. And what I mean by that is that uh, before you wake up, in the morning, your muscle is now turning on a set of genes that are going to be helpful for oxidizing fuels. Mm-hmm. All right. So whether that's fats or carbohydrates. So so those are turning on before you get out of bed. So the concept here is your muscle is preparing for active phase. It knows it's going to be needing this. And then, you know, in converse, when you get to sort of the end of your active phase, what you see are genes that are important for fuel storage, things mm-hmm. for glycogen storage. Um, potentially some fat storage that occurs that's healthy. Um, and so when I think about metabolism and muscle in the clock, what the clock's doing is is sort of saying, okay, we know when you're going to be active and when you're going to be resting. So we're aligning our metabolic uh, parameters, and this includes glucose uptake. Mm-hmm. This includes oxidative metabolism to be aligned. So we're ready to go when you're going to be active. So we can take in fuels, we can burn fuels. And then while we're resting, we're going to work really hard to store. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Now the liver is going to do a variation of that only probably flipped, right? So the the liver is one one of the many jobs that the liver does is it provides glucose. I mean, so it, it supports glucose levels while we're sleeping or mm-hmm. during that long fast, right? So you let's say you sleep from 11 to 6 or whatever, you know, during that time you're not eating, but you've got to maintain blood glucose. Where is that blood glucose going to come from? Is the liver. Mm. So the liver's got this important role for maintaining blood glucose during rest. And then also it knows during the active phase, it may get called on to support with glucose production to help support all the active muscles and active brains and all these things. And so the clock in liver is is going to be regulating this part. Mm. Um, then you've got the brain clock that's regul- that's contributing to some of the behavioral um, aspects and then things like you know, as I talked about, the the autonomic nervous system that will play a role in interacting with, let's say, the adrenal gland in terms of some hormone release and just different hormones, you know, cortisol and that kind of thing. So for you to be healthy mm-hmm. and, res- and, and let's say take on a physical challenge and exercise is the easiest one that I think about the most. It, you know, it's not just muscle, but you've got to have all the cast of supporting characters in there to to that can, you know, so your muscles can have the demand, but your body can manage all the other things. So, and the clocks are part of keeping these things working together, right? Yeah. So, so if you, if you, if you can go with that concept, now what happens is, let's say, um, I, you know, I have, I don't know, light at night or some kind of thing that's happened. I just start disrupting some, but maybe not all of my clocks. You know, like I said, so, you know, you can have situations where the brain clock will shift. The other clocks may not be shifted or you can shift the peripheral clocks and not the brain. And so now it's like, you know, well, this is going here, but this is not. So, so you have mis- mismatch, metabolic mismatch. Yeah. Okay. And and when you have the that that's that is that therein lies the chronic disease problem. I mean, yeah. again, this is not an overnight issue. You can handle this just fine, and especially if you're younger, you can handle it. But if you have this chronically, then it, it's it's you know all of a sudden your muscle maybe is not ready to get glucose. You know, it's, it's, it's maybe, you know, cause so in, in, insulin sensitivity in the muscle is something the clock contributes to regulation. Yeah, so That's the easiest way to think about it in terms of diabetes is that, yeah. okay, the liver is putting out glucose because it, you know, it knows everything needs to start storing, 
But the muscle's like, nah, I don't feel like it now. And so so now you've got, you know, the muscle stores, you know, 80 some percent of glucose. If it's not going to take the glucose up, your circul- circulating levels of glucose are going to be high. Yeah. And and so it's that kind of concept in, in which you have this misalignment of clocks within the systemic physiology of the human. Yeah. And will will just very simply lead to increases in blood glucose. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, with that, all that sort of cascade of inflammation and that progression of disease. No, I get that. Um, Karen, you mentioned that, you know, younger people may deal a little bit better with potentially some of the challenges or misalignment. Are there changes in the action of the peripheral clocks or the ability of them as we age? Is that, do, do we see that happen? Yeah. So this, this is actually a really interesting and uh, aspect so we, we we have jumped into this topic and um and there there are other labs that are coming along with this too there's there's no doubt when you look at sort of circadian behavior aspects what and 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 also things like heart rate rhythms and blood pressure rhythms as people age the robustness of those rhythms of the physiological variables diminish so mm. they, they we talk about things being damped and what what i mean with that is sort of if you think of the peak and trough of a rhythm then as we age those peaks and troughs get a little bit less separate yes <laughs> and and so um so there are so we along with a number of groups have been looking at uh both peripheral clock function as well as central clock function and and there's no doubt about it. The clock function is changing as we age. It's it's apparent in um, again our our work is in preclinical models. Yeah. So it's apparent in a, a middle aged animal. Um, yeah. You don't have to wait till you're really old. You can already see pro- see problems or changes in the clock. And this is both centrally as well as peripherally. And and so it, it I you know and then there were there were a couple of very recent papers in the last month again, in, in animal models, but have been implicating the contribution of circadian rhythms to lifespan. Oh, so one of the things with aging that has been a really big deal is is something called caloric restriction. So if you put animals on, you know, reduce how much they eat, you can get them to live longer. Well, there's a group in Texas just did this and then asked, well, what if we take the same calories and fed them to the animal during the rest phase or during their active phase or let them eat whenever they wanted to? What's the impact? Well, those that ate only during their active phase had the greatest extension of lifespan. And and they had some experiments that implicated uh the, the the rhythm the clock function so this molecular timing mechanism uh being uh maintained better with yeah. age and so i i think this is going to be a really interesting time to see whether um you know in terms of human populations thinking about you know what time do our people eating what and if we have an activity program do we think about when we're implementing the activity and, you know, what are they getting exposed to the right wavelengths, you know, the, the appropriate wavelengths of light and trying to help the circadian systems within their body work together to keep them healthy longer? Yeah, so interesting because, you know, from a nutrition perspective, I've read a lot of the literature and I, I've talked a lot about how uh, yeah, hormones and enzymes, their actions diminish over time as we age. So, for example, with protein intake, we need more mm-hmm. of the leucine protein to stimulate the same response in the brain as a 50-year-old compared to, say, a 15-year-old. Like, the, mm-hmm. you just need more of that sort of uh, stimulus. But some of that might be related to what's going on with the circadian clocks then in those tissues potentially. Yeah, yeah, no. So what, what what when we really dive into each of the tissues and look at what's what's changing with age and circadian rhythms, things related to protein metabolism, fat mm-hmm. metabolism, mitochondria, DNA damage, things that we just that are absolutely associated with aging. Those are those are processes that the clock does less well as yeah. as it's getting older. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Karen, is there any reason to think that there are sex differences in our circadian rhythms Mm -hmm. and and how things sort of change over time? Are we, you know, what do we know in that area? 
Uh, it's, I, 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 I wish I could tell you more, but I, but unfortunately we don't know much. Um, part of it from the, from the sort of more molecular end is that it's, it's actually goes back to things like cost of experiments, right? So, yeah. um, be, be doing circadian experiments means you have to look at lots of time points. You can't just do one time point, right? So, so then you expand your analysis by 12, let's say, um, that said, uh, there is absolutely a big gap in the field. And, and uh, we are about to embark on looking at sex differences, again, preclinical, but sex differences in um, muscle and heart uh, in terms of circadian function. So I, I, I think that will, it will absolutely, I mean, I think there are absolutely going to be differences. Um, I mean, if I had to guess, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to guess that the female clock is actually more robust than the male clock, just based on some of the things, you know, I don't have any firm data on that, but, but, um, you know, I, you know, and, and, you, and you can go to stories like, you know, or con concepts. I mean, you know, obviously women that have children, um, those first that first year at a minimum and maybe more are, are pretty well circadian disrupted. <laughs> yes. And so I think, I think there's some robustness in a, in a woman's circadian system that obviously can a an adapt. I mean, it may not be comfortable, but you can, you can survive it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, that's sort of anecdotal kind of storytelling, but, but I, I, in, in some of our animal studies, I think, you know, when we see phenotypes with clock disruptions, they always tend to be a bit more dramatic in the males than in the females. And so, so from that perspective, I'm going to say that I think the female's clock function is actually better. Yeah. And would that play at all into, and I know obviously this is all just um, speculation, but um, women's lifespans tend to be longer than men as well. So that must, in some sort of inform maybe part of your opinion is it yeah no i mean i i, I think yeah. you're absolutely right it is wild i'm not wild but it is speculation but but could you know i do think the 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 ability of the clock to function with age is a contributing factor to keeping our tissues healthy keeping us healthy mm. i mean obviously our lifestyles are going to affect that but our lifestyles can affect our clocks yeah and so um but but it may be that the female clock is a bit more resilient and so given equal situations then on average females are going to live a little bit longer than the males yeah and i also when i was thinking about um our discussion today and just trying to find some information on on some of the questions I had I couldn't find anything related to menopause and the impact that that might have on the circadian clock which of course then that fits actually because you've just told me there's not a lot of research in that space right now yeah no I mean I you know the only thing that I can you know sort of laughingly share is that I think if you talk to most women post-menopause sleep is 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 a precious come I just you can't sleep the way you used to yeah. and anytime you have sleep disruption you're going to have circadian disruption so so I'm gonna I'm gonna again speculate wildly that that menopause is going to be a it's going to be a bump in the in the circadian aspect with women. Yeah, yeah, but and and to your point, more disca more circadian disruption, yet longer lifespan. So you're right, actually. I mean, this is just you know uh, reinforcing your potential, you know, your hypothesis around it. Mm. Um. So as I understand it, Karen, a lot of your work has been looking at exercise and the circadian rhythm. And I've seen studies out of, um, I'm pretty sure your lab, or you've, um, you're certainly the author on the papers, around time of day and the best time to train with regards to mm -hmm. um, our circadian rhythm. So um, what do we know about training and circadian rhythm? Um, well, th there's, uh, yeah, so this is, it's, it's, so we we actually have a manuscript we're getting ready to submit so it has not been published so we we just did a study where we took um and trained animals either like just when they get up so so generally speaking you know so i was a runner uh a little bit of runner now but i was you know, a lot more when i was younger but i was always morning yeah. it was like roll out of bed go out get out in the road and run 
And then if I, you know, if, if for whatever reason I couldn't do that and I tried to run in the afternoon, I could do it, but I always felt crappy and I could never, you know, I tried to figure out my nutrition, my feeding, all that. Just, anyway, so I was always a morning runner. So, so we had a, a, a postdoc in the lab said, okay, let's, let's look at this morning versus afternoon running. Cause there, there's a little bit of literature in, in human studies as, and as well as in some animal studies. And so we took a, a cohort of mice and, and first off, if you just do a run to exhaustion test with mice, the same mice, if you say, okay, here you go on the treadmill, do what you can, you know, morning versus afternoon, the afternoon runners actually run significantly farther um, mm. and, and was really striking. I mean, it's just like, I mean, at first I didn't believe it. So we did it over again. And so... <laughs> So, so yes. So at least with mice, you, you, there is a very dramatic difference in run to, that these are run to exhaustion tests, not VO2 max, yeah. but run to exhaustion tests. And so then what Stuart did is he said, okay, well, I'm going to take one group of mice and I'm going to train them in the morning, but I'm going to train them. And then I'm going to take another group of mice and train them in the afternoon, but I'm going to train them at the same relative intensity, okay. so, which means that the absolute intensity of the morning runners is a bit lower than the afternoon runners, right? So if you're, so he stayed with 70% of their max endurance. And so he tracked them for, you know, each, so then after week three, he went in and said, okay, are you guys adapting? Are you adapting the same or, you know, and so what we saw after week three is that both group of, groups of mice improved their endurance, but to the same magnitude. So the afternoon runners were still performing better than the morning runners, okay? Mm. Then we tested them at six weeks and then all things went wacky. So um, meaning by the time we got to six weeks, those morning runners were performing the same as the afternoon runners. Huh. So, so, it, so it's like, oh, well, that's great. But then again, as, as someone that's trained in exercise physiology, I'm sitting here going, but wait a minute. That means they started lower, they finished the same, so they had a bigger adaptation. All right. Yes. So they, 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 had, they, their performance increased about 1.8 fold, mm -hmm. whereas the afternoon runners only increased about 1.4 fold. So it was a significantly different, uh, amount, uh, that was, that changed. And, 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 and then the other part, I'm just like, but they were even at lower intensity. I mean, they're not intensity. They were lower absolute, you know, so the, what they were, the speed they were running at was actually slower than, than those afternoon runners. So, so it's like, this is like, what is going? So, so we really believe that there is some kind of internal adaptation that's occurring that's promoting yeah. this significant improvement in performance time in these morning runners. So what Stuart then did is he said, okay, well, let's look at some of the obvious things. Are there differences in body weight with training in morning or afternoon? No. Are there differences in body composition, lean versus fat mass? No. So it's absolutely the same. Then we measured, you know, in response to these tests, we did measures of lactate and glucose and said, you know, do we see anything different in these metabolic markers? No. So they look virtually the same. And then we looked at glycogen storage. So one of the, you know, to, for improvement in endurance, glycogen storage, both in the liver and the muscle is really important. But well, training, so training does what training does. So there is yeah. a training training induced increase in glycogen storage, both in the liver and in the muscle. However, there was no difference depending on whether you were training in the morning or in the afternoon. And so, so then we went and we, so, you know, we're a circadian lab. So we said, okay, well, well, maybe there's some shifts in the clocks that may be aligning themselves differently. And absolutely. So the, the, the mice that were running in the morning, the clocks in their muscles shifted mm -hmm. like earlier, about two hours, mm. maybe even more, maybe it was three. And then the mice that were running later in the afternoon, their clock shifted backwards. Um, so again, it's the same exercise, but it's applied at different times. And the impact on the clock function in the muscle is very different. The morning runners, you know, advance the clock, the, the late runners delay the clock. The clock in the brain doesn't change. Okay, so there's this is not a central clock change. This is a peripheral right. clock change. Yeah. And so what it looks like to us is that the muscles are really sensitive to when you're doing, in this case, run training. And I would speculate yeah. that weight training would do the same thing. 
but we don't know that. Um, and so what they do is they adjust their phase. So they're, they, they know it's like, okay, I know this animal is going to be running at this time. I need to, and so I'm going to, my adaptation is to shift the phase of the clock to best support the running of that animal. And, um, and we see some indications of clock changes in fat and in lung. So, so I think there's a very, very much a circadian shift in the circadian system in, in these peripheral tissues that are coming with the morning runners versus the afternoon runners. And we, yeah. we hypothesize that these shifts are absolutely necessary for that, that bigger adaptation in the morning runners to be tested. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting because I'm I've always been a morning runner mm -hmm. and uh you sent your email to me and I just happened to because I knew we had our podcast interview I just wanted to double check before I went out on my run that um I hadn't had a a, a oh need to reschedule or whatever email which is why I was able to respond because normally mm -hmm. I wouldn't look at my email that early. Um but since I was 15 have gotten up so this is 30 years of getting up in the morning to run. And just as you describe, I can run in the afternoon and sometimes I have a stellar run in the afternoon, but usually mm -hmm. everything feels off. Everything mm -hmm. just feels horrible. So I, is what you're describing is that my peripheral clocks in my muscles have shifted with the habit of me running. So it's now supporting and actually it's just – enhancing my performance because it's in the morning because I'm used to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, 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 the thing is when you look at really elite athletes and, and, mm. it, you know, I mean, if it, so when they're performing at some kind of international level, I think most of the time they train in whatever their event is going to be at about the time they're going to be performing. Yes. Yes, they do. And, and I, I think they figured it out without knowing about clocks. Right. Yeah. And so, <laughs> So I, I, I mean, I really think when you when you start looking at elite performers that you you know they they don't really care about the basic science. They just want to do what what's going to work for their body and their performance. Yep. And I think sometimes we can learn more from them from what they do. Yeah, no, totally. And often when I um, talk to coaches and and things about training methods, you often see that the science follows the method, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, mm -hmm. oh, this is this thing we know. Oh, I wonder what the mechanism is. And so, you know, if there's money <laughs> and there's interest, it will be studied and then, then it'll show up in the literature. Um, what about maximal strength? So what do we know about maximal strength and um, time of day training? Yeah, so that 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 is actually that was that, so I had a, a graduate student in my lab put together a small review on the on the time of day and strength. Um, this was a co this was a COVID project for him, but it was really quite interesting because I, I mean I had seen some literature on this, but I hadn't realized how many groups had actually looked at this. Um, and and so ultimately, what Colin ended up doing though is just focusing on a very specific aspect of strength, and that's uh, maximum isometric force in humans. Um, because w w the thing is when you start getting into different kinds of strength, like dynamic mo measures or isokinetic or then, uh, you know, the reality is researchers have used, you know, different equipment, different, different approaches. And so it becomes very difficult to compare across studies to see what sort of the common feature is. So, mm -hmm. so we just decided to focus with maximum isometric strength. And I, and it was really actually um, impressive to me because people have been looking at this for about 20 years and and it, it, it when it when it comes to humans and exercise, it probably is the most consistent outcome I've ever seen in that humans are stronger in the afternoon. And I don't care whether mm. you're talking grip strength or whether you're talking elbow flexors or whether you're talking yeah. knee extensors, knee flexion, you know, or whether you're talking males or females, there doesn't seem to be a sex difference in this. It's, it's just, it is stronger in the afternoon. And so I, you know, and, and again, it's sort of the, 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 the trainees I've had in my lab that are really into strength training have always worked out in the afternoon. Again, sort of going back to the athletes will teach us how this works. So I, I think, you know, I th um, when it, and it doesn't mean you can't improve strength by training in the morning, but it just means mm. that if, if one has to, you know, and, and, and we don't really 
exactly know why you're stronger in the afternoon. Um, there are a few studies that have looked at, you know, motivation and neural drive, and and there, the limited data on that are, are that it's it's that doesn't seem to explain the strength differences. So there could be some intrinsic muscle properties that are changing. Yeah, which we just don't know yet. Yeah, and so therefore, does it would it follow that you're going to get better gains if you train in the afternoon compared to the morning? You could, you could. I mean, it, it, you know, so it's. Um, I mean, there the thing with the 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 and, well. So if you're talking about gains in strength, um, so so when we get into the sort of resistance exercise world, there are those people that really don't care about strength; they just want their muscles to get bigger. And then there are those that are really interested in the strength gains, and, and maybe muscles will change. Um, I I think in terms of strength gains. You know, one would propose that yes, you could you would do better with the afternoon because you can load the muscles more because you will be stronger. Um, yes. You know, I think. Uh, so that so that's I guess that's that would be the 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 hypothesis at this stage. I think there could be a big again, kind of like the endurance exercise. I think there could be a bigger delta. You could see a greater change in strength. Um, if you started training in the morning, um, and then what one, one would expect is that, you know, the clocks would shift over and, and that you could, you could see the same thing with, with strength as you, we yeah. did with the running. Yeah. So interesting. Cause I, again, I just think about how this relates to me because being a morning person, I've mm -hmm. done everything in the morning. And so mm -hmm. I've already always gone into my strength. To, actually, I've changed that somewhat in that I, I do do some strength training in the afternoon um, now. But I always I have often wondered whether I'm doing myself a disservice by only doing stuff in the morning compared to the I, afternoon. You know, I don't, I don't, well, I, I don't see any evidence for that right now. I think that where you would run into problem if you, if you randomize your training. So I, I think, mm. you know, when people ask me about this, it's sort of, again, you know, what I always want to say is that train when you want to train when yeah. it feels best for you, train when you can fit it in. Yeah. Um, and I think what I would say, take from our, our study that I talked about is that the clocks will adjust, you know, so your system mm. will adjust, just do it and do it consistently. Um, yeah. What would be bad is randomly training. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like training the chaos in the morning theory. one day, training in the night the other day, you know, it's just, it, I think, I, yeah. I think that, that, that would limit adaptations. I think there would be a problem with that. Yeah. And that, you know, with everything that we've sort of been discussing around the consistency of the circadian rhythm and, and how the clocks operate, it does seem that, that that consistency and routine is something that the body really appreciates and our physiology mm -hmm. sort of runs best on, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, that the... The underlying assumption with the clocks and human physiology or, or any physiology is that the clocks are w working on, you know, to prepare you for the sort of the, the stresses or the activities of the day and then manage the repair and storage at night. OK, yeah. So so the clock is going to be turning things on before you're awake just and, and it will start closing up the shop before you're asleep kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And Karen, does this change? Um, and you may or may not know this, and that's because um, I didn't see any uh, real research on it, but does this change when we should take different supplements to be most oh. helpful in alignment with circadian rhythm? Like, do, what do we know about that? Well, I mean, it's, so it's limited. The, the biggest amount of research that's ongoing right now is, is more in the pharmaceutical range. And so, so something like, yes. so the, the best example for this is statins. So in, in the United States, it's like in the drinking water. So people taking statins to help with cholesterol. So your liver makes cholesterol at night. So there's actually, you're better off taking your statins before you go to bed. You can go okay. on a lower dose and and minimize any secondary effects by 
timing when you take the statin. So that is one great example of what we call chronopharmacology or, or, or yes. thinking about the timing of, of your medicine. Now, and this will be really important for any medicine that has sort of what we would call a short half-life. So it does, it's yeah. something that doesn't last in the body a long time. There's also a significant body of literature in chemotherapies because obviously chemotherapies are really harsh and, and mm. they can be really debilitating for people. But they're finding that time of day in which the chemotherapy, and it will depend on the type of chemotherapy. So this is this is just very generic right now. But yeah. that the, the, there are times of day that one can give chemotherapy. Again, um, it can be a, a efficacious dose, but it can be a lower dose. So then all those neg negative side effects can be at least attenuated somewhat, so that the patient doesn't doesn't get as sick and and it potentially limit the ability of them withstanding chronic treatment for a cancer. And this oh, this ranges from drug delivery as well as radiation therapies. So I think wow. we're, we're starting to see some real recognition of this, and and hopefully, I mean, it's again, it doesn't cure the cancer or anything, but it just makes makes the treatment a little bit better for the person involved. Yeah. Um, there, there are a lot of other studies ongoing about, uh, different types of drugs as well. And so I think there's a real space and that, so, so supplements, absolutely. I mean, so, so the, the, the same concept here is that, you know, if you're taking a supplement for a particular function and, and the supplement is, you know, just has, you know, you take it and it sort of has a, a, a reasonable period in the bloodstream and then is gone then you you want to be taking it at a time when it's going to do the most good for whatever that that issue is yeah. um you know it's just like i and again i sort of go back to things you know so being a runner so thinking about marathons and and trying to you know people trying to keep maybe some glucose in as as they're running or if you know the different kinds of ways that you sort of feed while you're running versus that immediately after a race Versus that when you're preparing, I mean, you have different strategies to either maintain blood glucose while you're running or replenish stores afterwards. And, and some of that has a time of day dependence. And so, so one has to think, yeah. one can think about that more. I, you're absolutely right. Nobody's really entered into that space. So I think that'll be really interesting. Yes, yeah, so interesting. And I've also seen research looking at how the body tolerates carbohydrate in the evening time, and you mentioned that the liver has a peripheral clock when it metabolizes its nutrients. And mm -hmm. do, you know, the the I, I might have only been one or two studies that I saw that that appeared that having carbohydrate later in the evening was going to be less helpful for our metabolic health mm -hmm. because of that met metabolism. Do we know much about? Um, so, one is that correct? And, and two, I suppose, what else do we know about the way that we, you know, the nutrients we eat in the peripheral clocks? Yeah, I, I think um, so. So what we do, what I feel confident about is we know that it would be nutrient independent. But if we eat, mm. so if we eat, if, if I go and start eating at 10 o'clock at night, that's telling the clocks in my peripheral tissues. And that would be liver, um, heart. Um, mm. muscle and and it would would function to sh start shifting those clocks to that later time point so so there's so there's a couple of things in your question so the one the first off so if we eat carbohydrates late at night um i could imagine it could be uh bad i don't uh, to be honest with you i don't know that that literature particularly well but i think mm. you know so so when i think about Nighttime, I, again, I go back to the liver working to keep blood glucose up and, you know, the mm. muscle storing. So if now you add on more, so the liver is already putting out glucose. Now you add on more from from eating um, that that may sort of push the system a little over the top. That's again, yeah. that's, it's it's a speculation, but but that's a possibility. And, and that kind of what I think is important is to consider the concept that chronically high levels are not good. So yeah. again, you know, what our clock's doing is oscillating. So it's like you, you want things on, but you don't want them on all the time. You want them off some mm. of the time too. And so anytime you start chronically increasing or chronically keeping things high, you know, it's kind of like keeping your engine running too high for too long. It's just, it, it ultimately that, that does not do good things for the engine. 
Now, in turn, I mean, there. So, so the specific sort of, you know, when you eat fats and when you eat carbohydrates or when you eat proteins, I think that that kind of work is coming. It's not really there yet. I think the other interesting space is is in type two diabetes, and and yeah. because with diabetes you do see effects on the clocks and the peripheral clocks. And so that does start interfering with, um, uh, let's say, so I, I think it's Eulene Zareth's group um, in the Karolinska has shown with diabetic subjects, for them, exercise in the morning is actually not good because they, the, the, mm. they have a, a glycemic response. So it goes up and then it stays up for quite a long time. And oh, so wow. for that patient population, it might be recommended that they exercise in the afternoon. Oh, interesting. Because mm -hmm. I I wanted to ask you about exercise and glucose tolerance. Because I did see that you had a paper looking at how exercise can almost rescue the glucose intolerance that we might get from sleep deprivation. Is that mm -hmm. is right. that what your paper? Yeah, can you just describe that a little bit? Actually, the group in Australia that had worked with um, so they did did a. a I, I, I would not have wanted to do this study, but they did a sleep disruption <laughs> study and yeah. then looked at it plus or minus sort of some exercise. I think they did high intensity interval training as the exercise intervention and then looked at some parameters, uh, both of circadian rhythms and then also a variety of metabolic uh, aspects. And and the exercise was beneficial. And, and, and so um, especially in terms of some of the metabolic parameters. So I think... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I see exercise, I, I think a lot about it in terms of physical activity is that that's just part of our healthy physiology, right? That's how we've evolved yeah. is moving. Yeah. Yeah. And so so I, 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 it, it's not like, oh, I went to exercise class. No, this is a part of our, our <laughs> sort of how we stay healthy. Yeah. Um, and, and so, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really important for that. Yeah. So from that study, what I read was that if you do have sleep, if you are sleep deprived, and I know that that can impact negatively on your energy, but if you can do some exercise, it's actually going to offset some of those negative health implications of sleep deprivation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, it, it, it's, um, and that's in, in fact, that's what in terms of when people do, um, jet or travel, Right. So, mm. so one of the things is, and especially those people that travel a lot, what, if you talk to them, the first thing they do when they get off a plane is they move and, yeah. you know, maybe it's going for a walk, maybe it's going to the gym, but, but it's, you know, it's moved. Then you get light on whatever the cycle is where you're, where you are and, and you, you start, you know, eating at that, at the times of that place. And that will help in, in shifting all your clocks better, but exercise plays a big role in that too. Yeah, yeah, totally. Karen, has your research changed personally any of your habits or lifestyle behaviors? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I, I'm not, so I, I don't, so, so what do I do? I, I'm much more attentive to my sleep schedule and, and I, I, I mm -hmm. attend to it. I mean, I'm consciously attentive to it. So, you know, it's sort of, um, I value sleep and I value sort of a, a schedule with that. Um, I, in terms of my eating, you know, un unless I have sort of social things where I'm going to, you know, go out and it'll take me out later, you know, I try to finish um, my, my eating, you know, around 6 PM. So fairly early. Mm. Um, mm. And I like, you know, since I am getting older, it's not because I like going out early, but it's just, so it's this idea that I want to try to, you know, I, I try to restrict my feeding to really kind of what would I would consider the active part of my day. So I probably start, yeah. you know, eat about, I don't know, depending on how early I get up and what I do about nine or 10 and then finish up about six. And so, I, and again, I'm not rigid. Um, because, you know, I enjoy yeah. friends and I enjoy life and, you know, sometimes you can, you know, like yeah. I, I, when you start being really rigid about your feeding schedule, then, then that can make that more difficult. Um, you know, my exercise schedule. Yep. I, I, well, like I said, exercise in the afternoon or evening has just never been an option for me. So I, I will, I will yeah. keep my morning, yeah. morning to mid morning exercise routine. 
Um, yeah, but, nice. but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of it. And I, th- I am aware of keeping my room dark at night and, and sort yeah. of minimizing light exposure. Um, yeah. Hey, I, you know, I mean, we, we all get older and, and I just want, I'm, I feel great. I'm healthy and I just want to stay that way as long as I can. So I'm, 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 I'm embracing the circadian <laughs> concepts. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love it. Um, actually, one question which is a complete tangent, but I always feel like if I'm having a glass of wine at lunch, which isn't very often, um, I feel like a wine before five is almost like worth two in terms of its impact <laughs> on how I feel. Is there anything circadian about that, like um, that we know, well, any sort of alcohol clock? There, yeah, so, so alcohol affects the clock, absolutely. And so, um, mm. you know, people are looking at both acute alcohol exposure as well as chronic alcohol exposure, and there's no doubt peripheral clocks are affected. Um, alcohol affects, you know, the central clock and sleep and, and, and sleep aspects as well. But, you know, that that sort of, I, I would agree, my experience has been um, quite similar in, in terms of, you know, if I, if I happen to have an... Uh, uh, a midday drink, I might as well write off the rest of the day. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know, maybe yours isn't that extreme, but I, but it's just sort of like, mm-hmm. you know, I could take a nap back here or something. It's just, um, <laughs> yes. where, whereas I feel a lot more engaged and social when I have a drink with dinner. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah. I, and so I think there, there are time of day. I don't think we know exactly why. Yeah. I often wondered whether there was a diurnal rhythm or something to the, uh, the enzyme, I think it's the, is it the alcohol dehydrogenase? dehydrogenase. The enzyme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Whether mm-hmm. that had something to, I always tell my students that. I just mm-hmm. go, you know, that's what it is. Um, yeah. Clearly I, they will just look at me like I have an idea, but I, I mustn't. <laughs> um, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of being the teacher. You can just, just with, as long as you keep your face straight. Just like, <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so Karen, finally, um, what research, I know we've t- actually talked a number of uh, things which, are areas for further research, but what is it that your lab is doing or what gets you excited in this space sort of moving forward? It all does. <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I think I, I'm just, we're having so much fun right now because it's, it's, we've gotten to the point where, you know, people recognize that, that keeping clocks healthy is part of human health. And mm-hmm. so, so yeah, so I think the, the work with aging and, and where we see that going and the role of the clock and in particular in the tissue that I study the most in muscle, um, mm-hmm. we're really excited about the role of the clock and, and its contribution to aging and skeletal muscle and sort of the weakness, the sarcopenia, the metabolic disorders. Yes. Um, the other thing that I think is going to be really interesting is people are starting to look at, and we have as well, is, you know, so if I mess up the clock in the muscle, what happens to the clock in the liver or what happens to the clock in, yes. in different organs? So, you know, these systems don't work by themselves and, and it's, it's challenging, yeah. and, but, but this is where, and this is an exciting aspect of where research is going is the communication between these other organ systems and the brain as well, obviously. Yeah. Um, and so there, so between the aging and then the exercise work sort of, I, I feel very strongly that, that the clock is a part that, that transcriptional clock network is a fundamental part of how our tissues respond to exercise and how they adapt to exercise. Yeah. And so, um, I'm really, I've got, uh, a few people in the lab that are really starting to dig in to into that to try to understand that better. Um, and again, I, you know, I think, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a biologist, a, a physiologist, I'm a scientist at heart. And when we can take this and apply this to humans, great. Right now, I'm just like, th- th- these questions are just exciting to me and fascinating. Yeah. And they're just, um, and I think they do have implications for humans. And that's what I'm hoping some of my colleagues will help me with. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that is fabulous. And that's, I feel similarly to um, your sentiments in that this is a really exciting area. And it does make sense because everything does work together. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm really interested to see sort of how this field expands over the years. Mm-hmm. Karen, can, where is the best place for people to find out more information about the work that you're doing uh, in your lab or just in this area, sort of biological rhythms, circadian rhythms? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question. I mean, so the, I mean, actually, you know, Google, you can Google me and, and Google Scholar. There's the, the papers that way. That's uh, yes. one of the best ways. I think um, there are, I mean, I'm happy if, if people email me and just sort of reference, you know, this conversation, I'd be happy to point people out. I mean, right now, there's not a sort of a centralized book or, or journal yeah. that I would send people to, but there are absolutely wonderful papers. And um, the other thing I can, I can email to you is there's the website for the society. There's a couple of societies. One is the um, Society for Research and Biological Rhythms. And then the other one is the, the European group. So the European group and, and both of those places have some resources that would be very helpful if people are interested. That is amazing. Thank you, Karen. And we will um, put the links to your research in the show notes and mm -hmm. also to the biological or the societies that you were talking about. That would be great as well, um, just so people who are interested, and there will be because it's such a fascinating sort of topic and these are the things that my audience love mm -hmm. hearing about um, uh, so they can go sort of for future sort of research. Um, Professor Karen, thank you for your time for your mm -hmm. afternoon. I really appreciate it and, um, and really look forward to seeing what comes out next. Oh, it's been really fun. So thanks, Mickey. I've really enjoyed it. Good luck. Take care. All right, team. Hopefully you've enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed chatting to Karen. And, you know, there is it's so interesting. There's so much we understand in this area, but there's just so much more that they're investigating and researching that we don't know. So, you know, I'm always so fascinated by the work that goes on into understanding the basis of our metabolism. So next week on the podcast, I speak to health advocate Sarah Tanner, all about her transition from a vegan diet for over six years to incorporating animal products for her health. And we just discuss her overall journey and what this means for her as an influencer and her reasons behind it and all of that stuff. So it's her lived experience, if you like. And I'm just so fascinated by changes that people make to their diet. And I think that you will really love this conversation that I have with Sarah too. But that's next week. Until then, you can catch me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition, on Twitter and Instagram at Mickey Willardin, or over on my website, mickeywillardin.com, where, as I said, you can grab yourself 50% off any of my programs. So team, until next week, and have a great week.